But one of the things that I wanted to talk to you a little bit <clears throat> about the farm and that most farmers realize right from the get-go is, is that all of creation, all of creation testifies about the glory of God. All of creation. So, Will, if you want to put the next slide up with the verses on there, I'm going to read from you Job 12, 7 through 10. Everybody thinks, oh, lessons of faith from a farmer. He's going to talk about sowing and reaping, right? That's the obvious one. Well, actually, we're not going to talk about that at all today. We're going to try to pinpoint a few other things. Job chapter 12 says, But now ask the beasts and let them teach you. Can we learn something from the animals? Well, that's certainly what Job is telling us. We can learn from the animals. Ask the beasts and let them teach you, and the birds of the heavens and let them tell you, or speak to the earth and let it teach you, and let the fish of the sea declare to you, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So all of creation, the earth itself and all of the animals testify of who God is, right? We all may be familiar with Romans chapter 1, verse 20. It says, for since the creation of the world, his, talking about God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Basically says man will be without excuse about knowing God because all of creation itself declares who God is. So we can learn about God himself through creation and through the beasts. You might be familiar with the passage in Luke 19 where Jesus, his disciples were shouting and singing hallelujah and some of the Pharisees said, hey, tell these people to be quiet. And Jesus said, no, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet because if they were quiet, what would happen? The rocks themselves would cry out, right? The rocks themselves would cry out. So hopefully we're a church where um, the rocks are not crying out, uh, that we uh, joyfully express our praise to the Lord at all times. But needless to say, the Bible clearly teaches us that creation itself testifies about God. All right, so here's what I want to do. So everybody who is four years and up, I would really appreciate if you could come down front because I have some things we're going to be looking at, and I'd like to put a few things into your hands. So don't be embarrassed if you're 12, 13, 14, 15, if you're 4, 6, 8, whatever. Come on down here and sit down front with me, please. I would appreciate it because I got some stuff I want to show you. Come on, guys. Thank you, thank you. Just sit right there on the floor. You can face me. Yeah, you can face me right there. And then I'm going to hand some stuff. And you can sit down on the floor. Go ahead, sit down. <laughs> sit down on the floor. All right, we'll get it figured out here in a little bit. All right, so the way I used to always do when I was teaching Sunday school and I used to teach a program called Royal Rangers, which some of you guys know about, is um, I think I know most of you guys' names, but what I would always do is I'd have everybody introduce themselves and then I would always just go around the room and say, call all the boys Billy and all the girls Sally. And that was the easiest way to remember because they all had the same name. Kind of like following George Foreman's philosophy, naming all of his kids George. Can't forget them anyways. Okay. So here's the deal. We learned about creation testifying about God, right? In Genesis chapter 1, how many of you are familiar with the story of creation in Genesis, the book of Genesis? I'm going to very quickly read through this. It says, Then God said, listen up, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and guess what God said? He saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth 
and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. What do you suppose that means? God told us that we're supposed to rule over creation. We're supposed to rule over the the fields and the animals. Does that mean we get to be their boss? Kind of. You know what it means? If you look that up, it really means that we have to take care of it. It's there for our benefit and for our use, but we have to take care of it because it's a special gift that God gave us, right? All right, so then God says, I have given you every plant yielding seed that's on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit, it shall be food for you. And then he says, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. So the things that God made, God, his creation, has declared that it is very, very good. Awesome. Okay. So, however, sometimes creation goes bad. Has anybody ever heard the phrase, all it takes is one bad apple? One bad apple. I have something here I want you guys to pass around. know if you guys can see it back there it's starting to get a little pungent uh what is that bobby is it a, what kind of fruit is it an apple right what's wrong with it it's got some bruises on it yeah would you call that a rotten apple would you eat that apple <laughs> it's got mold on it. You would? Okay. Why don't you take it and pass it around and feel it? Just feel it. It's not real squishy. It's just a little squishy. Go ahead and pass it around. <clears throat> so what do you think they mean when it says all it takes is one bad apple? What would happen? Who knows what would happen if I would put that apple in a basket full of other good apples. What would happen, Jesse? It would spread, right? The rottenness would spread. And then what would happen to the other good apples? They get rotten too. One bad apple is all it takes. All right. Let's look at the verses there. First Corinthians fifteen thirty-three. It says, Do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good morals. It says in the NIV, bad company corrupts good character. I don't know if you've ever heard that verse before, but has anybody ever told you, you know what? If you hang around with the bad kids, what starts to happen? Yeah, you get bullied, yeah, if you stand up for what's right. But oftentimes what can happen is, is we wind up doing stuff we shouldn't do ourselves too. So what this lesson is about is is it's an encouragement to be careful of who we associate ourselves with, right? Because sometimes all it takes is one bad apple in a collection of good ones to make the whole bunch go bad. And it's in there. It's right there in the Bible. Now, does that mean that we're not allowed to associate with people who are not Christians? That's not what it means at all. As a matter of fact, if you look at that passage in the Bible where Paul is saying that, that, you know, uh, bad company corrupts good morals, he's actually, in the context, in where he's talking about that, he's actually talking about false teachers in the church. And he's not talking about, you know, never talking to people who aren't Christians. It says, beware of who you associate with within those people who call themselves Christians. Because some people like to call themselves Christians and then don't act like it and don't live like it. 
or teaching things and trying to get you to do things that you shouldn't do that you know aren't right to do, right? That's, that's the real lesson. Those are the true bad apples that we need to be careful and be wary of. All right, so now there's another lesson we can learn from the farmers, and that is that everything must grow. So I have my son, Michael, he's going to come up here and he's going to show you something that he uses on the farm. This should be on, so you can hold that too as well. Well, you want to turn me on, please? We got the handheld live? Okay. All right, well, this is a calf bottle. Um, it used to be that uh, every morning I would go out and uh, do chores, and feeding calves was one of the very first things I would do. Um, we used to have, shoot, about 20 or 30 of them. And um, you would mix up like a five gallon bucket, and you have some of this, it's called calf replacer or milk replacer. And it's basically um, powdered milk, and it's got some added ingredients to it. So some vitamins and minerals that really help them. Because um, calves are very vulnerable to disease, especially this year we've had a lot of pneumonia. Um, so I'll mix in some of that, and then we also have some different um, vitamins and um, antibiotics I also mix in for them. And you mix it in, you have a set amount that you need to mix because you don't want to add too much of that stuff and make them sick. You don't want to put too little in there and then they don't get what they need. Um, so we measure out how much powder we need, mix it with some water, warm water, and you just pour it into these little bottles. And um, each calf would have its own pen and you just set it right there in the pen got a little holder and it takes the calf surprisingly about uh, one or two minutes to drink this whole thing. Wow. Um, so th they go pretty fast and um, they only get one of these a day and then they get um, some water to drink and some hay and um, little pellets for them. Um, so that's what we used to do every morning. We don't bottle feed calves anymore. Um, they're out on the pasture. Because they're growing up. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. All right, thank you very much. So I have here some of this actual milk powder that they used to mix up to feed the calves. You guys want to taste it? Yeah. It's good, yeah. What's it taste like? <laughs> it doesn't taste so good. It doesn't taste so good? It just tastes like dry milk, doesn't it? You guys want to try it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So probably probably all of us remember we probably have fond memories of when we used to use one of these, right? Don't you remember that? <laughs> I hopefully hopefully you were too young that you don't really remember that too well. None of you guys are still using one of these, are you? <laughs> Let's hope not. What are bottles used for? I mean, what age do we use bottles for? What for babies, right? Yeah. Why do we give them? Why do we give them a bottle? Why do we feed them milk? Why don't we give them a steak, an apple pie? They don't. They don't have any teeth. They can't chew it, and they might. They might choke on it, right? All right. So they have to drink milk, which is something that they can digest and helps them to grow, right? But here's the other thing. I said everything must grow. What, were, what would happen if we didn't give those calves milk? They, they wouldn't grow, and they would eventually what? They, they'd die. That's exactly right. So <clears throat> let's look at some verses. Think about that lesson, right? If you don't grow, what's going to happen to you? You're, you're going to die. Not, the calf isn't just going to stay stunted and stay small, right? Calves are cute. We think, oh, well, we'll just stop feeding the calf, and so I'll have a cute little calf the rest of its life. No, it won't last very long. It will actually die. Same is true on everything else. 
people as well. You think, eh, I've learned as much as I need to learn. I'm good. I don't need to grow anymore. I'll just stay where I'm at. Not going to happen, folks. You actually either must grow or you will die. So let's look at this verse here in Hebrews. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. All right, so for Christians, what it means is that as we grow, we're able to eat heartier food, and we're able to tell the difference between good teaching and bad teaching, right? So, but for the animals, we don't give them hard food until they grow up a little bit and they're able to chew it properly, right? They got to have teeth, like you said. They don't have teeth when they're babies. So part of our growth process as Christians is developing our spiritual teeth so that we can cut into the meat of God's word. Simple, right? Simple, basic lessons of profound faith that we can learn on the farm. But remember this, if you are not growing, you will die. Everything must grow. All right, moving on. Let's take a look at another lesson. That's about the importance of plowing straight, plowing straight. Now, I have here a tractor. This is a Ford, what's the model number? A 9600, Ford 9600. Uh, Michael is in the process of collecting model tractors of all the various tractors that he has actually driven. So this is a tractor, the full-size one, that he has actually used on the the farms that he has worked on, right? Pretty decent-sized tractor. Look at those big wheels, right? You can imagine if it were large enough to actually sit in there, uh, you could do some heavy-duty work with that. So you could use a tractor like this to plow a field. You know what plowing a field is? You attach this big thing behind it and it's got sharp tools on it and it digs into the dirt and turns the dirt over, right? So <clears throat> why do you think we have to plow the field? Why, why, do, we, why do we do that? Kind of make it soft, right? So if you plant something, have any of you ever worked in a garden before? Maybe planted some seeds in a garden? I have some seeds here. Anybody know what kind of seeds these are? Oops. Yeah. Yeah, That's corn, exactly right. You can take a small number of those, not a huge handful, because we don't want to pick corn up all over the floor the rest of the day. Right? So there's corn. Now, you look at that, and you say, well, that's kind of hard. I'm used to eating corn on the cob, right? That's nice and soft and buttery and, and, and everything else. Well, it's a little different kind of corn. That's called sweet corn. But this is field corn. And you know what? We still eat this, but we don't eat it like this. We eat it in a variety of different ways. Usually they grind it up. Maybe they make corn chips out of it or tortillas. You like tacos? Yeah. Or maybe you're from the south and had grits. That's made out of corn, right? Okay, so you see a picture up there, and you see a tractor, and he's got a plow behind that, and he's plowing the field. He's turning the soil over in preparation for planting seeds, and probably very likely they'll plant something like corn in that field, right? So why do you think it's very, very, very important that that guy plows a straight row? Can you think why that might be important? Think about what happens. What happens after you plant this seed? A plant grows from it, right? Now, it takes a while, but you water it, you fertilize it, you throw manure on it. Michael does that, and then he comes home smelling like it. And after a while, it grows up. How tall does a a corn plant get? Some of them can get really tall. Yeah, like really tall, like taller than that tall. One of the first jobs I had uh, for a couple of weeks one summer was detasseling corn. 
every other row you had to pull the tassels so that it would fertilize. And that was a horrible job. It was hot, dirty, and sweaty, and the corn stalks were just a little bit taller than I was, and so I could barely reach the tassels. So try working all day long with your arms over your head sometime. Oh, make you sore. So, but anyways, the corn gets really, really tall. And if you plant straight rows, all the rows of the plants will be nice and straight too. Now, what happens after that corn is ready to pick? They bring in another machine. You can call it a harvester, right? And it's pulled behind the tractor. And you know what? It's got forks in it like a fingers on your hand. And it goes down the rows of that corn, and it pulls all the ears of the corn off, and it pulls the corn off of the, the husks, and it dumps it into a wagon that's being pulled behind them. But what were to happen if those rows of the corn plants were all crooked and wavy? Do you think this thing would be able to pick up all the plants? It would miss a lot of them, right? Because the lines are going every which direction. All right, so one of the reasons that it's very, very, very important to plow straight is so that when it comes harvest time, you actually are able to get the whole harvest and you don't miss a bunch. Let's look at a couple Bible verses about that. Proverbs chapter 4 tells us, Watch the path of your feet and all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. And it says in uh, Psalm 5, it says, O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. So the Bible talks about our paths being straight as being something that's pretty important, keeping our paths straight. And it's much for the same reason that a farmer has to plant straight rows. It's so that when it comes harvest time, we get a full harvest and we don't miss a bunch, right? Because otherwise we miss a whole bunch of things that could participate in the harvest otherwise. All right. Now, there's another verse that I'm going to talk about a little bit. It says in Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. And it says, And make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Now, that's a Bible verse talking about the importance of having a straight path, but it needs to be straight so that people don't stumble and fall on it. Have you guys ever hiked on a mountain trail with lots of rocks and stuff in it? Yeah. Have you ever sprained your ankle, like turned it sideways to the point where it hurts and it's hard to walk on? Sometimes that can happen if you're on a really rocky trail and it's going up and down and back and forth and everything else. Whereas if you have a nice straight path, chances of you stumbling and falling is probably not going to happen. So the Bible talks about it's very important for us to make straight paths so that other people who are following us won't stumble and fall. Pretty profound truth, isn't it, right? Set an example of a straight path so that we don't cause other people to stumble and fall. And as a matter of fact, Hebrews 12 says, instead of having their joints put out of place, it says they instead will be healed will be healed. So walking on a straight path is healthy for you. All right, let's move on. Another lesson we can learn from the farmer is the importance of protecting the weak. I'm going to have my wife Anita come up and tell you a story about chickens. Now, just between me and you, look at their eyes. I think chickens are evil. Go ahead and put the next slide up, Will. Anyway, we had chickens, and you know what chickens do? They're kind of, they're, I love chickens, but they can kind of be mean. So what happens is um, if you have chickens and one of them gets sick or gets lame or whatever, the other chickens will pick on them. So I'm going to tell you a story about Hoppy. So Hoppy 
was one of our chickens, and that's actually Poppy in the picture. She's sitting in my lap a few years ago. Um, so we had this chicken. She didn't have a name at the time. And all of a sudden, one day, she's kind of like hopping around. She's kind of lame. Couldn't, I looked all over, couldn't find anything wrong with her foot, but she just she wouldn't walk on it. So the other hens started picking on her, and they literally started pecking her. And their beaks are really, really, really sharp. Like, if they peck on your toe, it'll bleed. So they were pecking on, on she didn't have a name at the time, but they were pecking on this chicken. And she started getting, like, really, she just started getting sickly, and her feathers were coming out. And so I had to go in and I had to take her out of the pen. So I took her out of the pen, and I gave her special food. We actually kept her in the house for a while because we thought she was going to die. And, um, you know, we had to hand feed her, and she started, you know, getting, getting better. And we named her, I named her Hoppy because she would be hopping around. So Hoppy got better, um, and then we, you know, we couldn't keep a chicken in the house, which is kind of weird. So we let her just loose in our yard, because at the time we didn't have any dogs, because dogs and chickens don't usually mix, as we found out later. But anyway, um, at the time we had no dogs, so Hoppy was in the yard, she just had the whole yard, it was great. And then every evening, um, oh, her bed was in our shed, because chickens at night, they go to bed, but we couldn't put her in with the other hens because they pick on her, because they were bullies. So every night we put her in the shed. Well, whenever it was time for her to go to bed, she would hop up onto our deck, and she would come up to the glass sliding door, and she would peck on the door. And we'd hear this pecking noise. And, oh, there's Hoppy, she wants to go to bed. So then we put her to bed. Story of Hoppy. Eventually, long time, eventually we were able to put her back in with the other hens, but we had to watch her very close so that they wouldn't, you know, pick on her because her, her foot healed, so she was fine. Right. So we have to take care of the weak. So we had to take care of Hoppy until she was strong enough to be back with the other chickens. We had a rooster. Now, talk about evil chickens. We had a rooster. And that thing, you always had to face it when you were in uh, the pen. If you turned your back, he would charge you. And I mean, he would come up with spurs flying and he would, he would go for your leg. So you always had to face him. And I got to the point where I had to carry a stick with me every time I went in there because that rooster had it in for me for some reason. But, but you know what? It's a lot like life, right? You guys are at school. Who do bullies usually tend to pick on? Smaller kids, ones that are weaker than them, right? Same thing. So one of the lessons that we can learn on the farm is, is that we have to look out for the weak. We have to protect the weak, right? Okay, you guys can head on back to your seats. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, go ahead, you can sit down. Uh, the Bible says, and we just read that verse in Hebrews 12, right, about the importance of having a straight path, having a straight path so that we can have something that will actually heal those who are lame. In Isaiah 35, it says, strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. If you want to get encouraged, read all of Isaiah 35. That's a great chapter of God's promise for us as believers. Psalm 41 says, blessed are those who have regard for the weak because it says the Lord delivers them in times of trouble. So we will actually be blessed as well too when we help the weak out. Now, just to show you how important it is to help the weak, Paul in Acts chapter 20, when he gave his farewell to the church at Ephesus, this is the last thing that he's telling them. They wept bitterly when they said goodbye to him because they knew they would never see him again, that he was going off to his death. So you think, here's my last chance to encourage the church. I better tell them something important. And what does he say? He says in Acts 20, verse 35, he says, in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. 
Wow, what a profound truth. We can go through our whole lives and never have a regard for those who are destitute, downtrodden, and are weak in life. And we have missed a command straight from Scripture itself to help the weak. We've got to protect the weak. Another very, very, very profound truth that we can learn on the farm, right? All right. One other truth we can learn about farming is that life is better together. Life is better together. You see a picture up here of some Amishmen getting ready to lift a wall that has been framed out. This is an Amish barn raising. And um, so if someone in the community loses a barn, uh, due to, oftentimes due to fire or tornado or some destructive act, and they lose their farm, the whole community will come together, and in one day's time, they will build them a new barn. One day. Um, I've actually had the privilege of attending at least one Amish barn raising in my lifetime. And uh, the men work hard, the women uh, provide a great spread of food and, uh, and keep everyone well nourished and well hydrated. And um, in one day's time, they replace that, that entire barn. Let's go on to the next slide. Psalm 133, in verses 1 through 3, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head. It's as if the dew were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And if you see the picture up there in the corner, that is actually the finished barn at the end of the day of the first picture that we saw. So that was the exact same day. Uh, that's what they wound up with. And you think, wow, all I saw was a bunch of guys and some wood. And this is what they ended with by the end of the day. Colossians 3, it says also in verse 12, says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. The importance of dwelling together as a group of believers. Uh, life just goes better when we help each other out, does it not? Right? And as a matter of fact, it's not only important for us together, but it's also our witness to the world around us when we do that. John 13, 35 says, By this, walking in love and unity toward one another, it says, By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So it's not only important in terms of helping each other, but it's also critical to our witness. Very profound truths from the farmer, right? All right, we'll put the last slide up. Um, nothing earth-shattering today, but yet if you allow it to sink deep within you, there's some basic wisdom there. And this is what really I talked about from the very beginning of how creation itself testifies about God. So if we study creation, the world around us, it, it, sometimes it's like having a good Bible study. Now, don't use that as an excuse to not get into the word, right? I was talking to my cousin at the reunion a week ago, and he says, well, he says, you know what they say, it'd be better on the boat thinking about God than in the church thinking about fishing. It's like, hmm, that sounds like an excuse. <laughs> so forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, the Bible says. We need to fellowship together. We need to be in church. But we also need to be mindful of God's creation and the profound truths that we can learn in it. So hopefully you